Um, and so what, what I wanted to say is everyone is welcome. So today's topic is very interesting because I think many of us can agree that uh, supply chain is one of the applications um, that blockchain will and already has had so much impact in. Um, we always hear about Bitcoin, crypto, NFTs. Those have a big hype, right? Um, however, a blockchain will undoubtedly, in my opinion, have a big impact in the future of supply chains. And we can see it already happening today, actually. Um, so we are actually super uh, lucky to have Malik Mobasher joining us all the way from California um, to talk to us about more about this topic. Um, so Malik has more than 25 years of experience in business advisory, technology consulting, and professional mentoring. Um, Malik has delivered more than 250 engagements in advisory, consulting, um, transformation, and program implementation capacity. Malik is an entrepreneur, an um, angel investor, startup advisor. Uh, um, he's a selection committee member in multiple incubators and acceleration programs. Um, he is also a technology products development expert and has developed 17 software applications on multiple platforms. And his tech expertise are in blockchain applications, fintech, regtech, edutech, and collaboration platforms. So Malik is a consultant for Mentor Global Consultants currently, and he currently resides in California. And But before that, he was a resident in Dubai for 12 years. Um, so Malik has a very multicultural, he's bilingual, he has a very global citizen mindset. And so we're super happy to have him here today. And um, with that, we'd like to welcome Malik to speak uh, for our event. Thank you for this introduction. And uh, uh, I have placed a timer now of 40 minutes. Uh, this timer should beep and make me stop speaking, allowing you to, to uh, ask questions and interact. Uh, but please, uh, uh, whenever you have a question, whenever you have something which is not clear, feel free to jump, stop, and uh, ask, me, ask me questions. So, what uh, what I will uh, 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 be starting with is two stories. We we go and buy food. All, all of us, uh, anyway or another, uh, um, uh, buy food or uh, go and procure um, uh, our uh, fresh vegetables and uh, the fruits from supermarkets around us, and we don't think. Uh, of the safety of this food. We take it for granted that someone has done their job in making sure that these food are safe and these food are um, uh, ready to be uh, 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 ready uh, to be eaten, are edible, um, uh, uh, and we don't worry about uh, uh, its its safety, its uh, validity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, but if uh, uh, there are a number of foodborne diseases that can uh, uh, reach us, and the problem with these type of diseases is that in case it happened, um, it's very difficult for us to know what is the source of these germs or viruses or bacteria that are jumping into, into our food. And why is that important? Because uh, any supermarket or uh, who, who sell uh, uh, fresh vegetables and fruits don't get their uh, their products from one place. There are a lot of farmers and a lot of uh, parties involved in um, uh, in the supply chain for food. So, as as probably all of you know, um, uh, the produce start with a farm it's a farm someone uh, uh, in in country or outside the country uh, that the farmers will be uh, harvesting their produce and sending it to a packing house this packing house will put it into in packages all sort of boxes and send it ship it the shipment can be uh, uh, ground shipping like trucks or trains or it can be uh, air shipping like uh, uh, airplanes and uh, or uh, ships. It might be within the country or it might cross several continents until it reach wherever you are in the world. 
uh, and it might pass through multiple uh, um, customs in multiple countries. So there's always a border crossing and there's always um, uh, somebody who's checking it uh, any way or another. After it reaches this destination, it will go into a processing, um, a processing uh, um, uh, facility in which they will be packaged and prepared for uh, the consumers. Um, after that, it will go to distribution center in which it will be distributed to multiple um, uh, department stores or uh, major retailer like Walmarts. And at the end, it would reach the customer. The problem we have in this complex supply chain that in each one of these um, um, uh, stages, we have multiple parties. So it is not one farmer. It is not one packaging house. It's not one transportation. If if uh, if you think of a coffee shop, they the coffee shop might end getting their their coffee beans from something like twenty different uh, farm around the world. These twenty different farms might be going into a ten different packing house and using six or seven different transportation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when, when we want to track back any possible uh, um, uh, corrupted food or diseases to stop getting um, uh, this disease to be spread. So if, if we know exactly that this specific farm has this uh, uh, disease and it's produced, we would stop it on the spot. But how we can do that? These different uh, produce are mixed together in packing house. They are packaged in, in together in, in the processing house. So it might come from different places. So how I can know? It is a complex, um, a complex problem, especially that a lot of factors might enter into uh, into corrupting these. Uh, uh, fruits and vegetables like temperature, that uh, the amount of time they they spend in warehouses, um, 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 uh, how much human hands or exposure to to water, exposure to air, exposure to animals uh, they got, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a lot of um, uh, 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 elements that can come and affect the safety of these. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, food. Ideally, ideally, if we were able to trace the origin of all of these food, we will be able to um, uh, to exactly trace it back to the origin. So, if if I am looking now at a box of lemon in front of me, if I want to know where this lemon has been produced, which farm, where it has been packed what the transport it has been uh, in and what warehouse it has been stored, what distribution channel it came from. Uh, uh, it should be stored somewhere and I should be able to, to access it. But here's the problem. Here, the problem is that there's a lot of parties involved and these parties have various uh, degrees of capabilities in recording accurate uh, accurate data, in being transparent, and uh, little little ability for the uh, end consumer to make sure that there is no fraud, there is no uh, fortification, there is no um, uh, change of of data, and all these parties will try to. Uh, to, to push the, uh, um, uh, the ball to the other part in case of something happened. So um, if, if uh, 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 God forbid, a, a, a foodborne um, disease happen, no one wants to bear responsibility. So the truck company will say, no, no, it's, it's the warehouse. The warehouse, no, it's the farmer. The farmer say, no, uh, it's, uh, it's the shipping company. So how how we can how we can know how we can have a, a system which which uh, uh, everyone can trust and everyone can connect to and no one can uh, later come and alter 
any data. So a food traceability system should be uh, an, auditable, an, an auditable record. Audit, audit, um, uh, auditable record means that people can come back later anytime to check it and, uh, and uh, check the validity of the information uh, in it. Um, it should not be altered. No one can come and change anything uh, uh, in it. And it should allow multiple parties to write and read from it in a full transparency way. No one party have a control to hide some part of the information from the other uh, party. So this is a story of a food supply chain, which tell us that a better type of technology is, is needed. Another similar story, not from the food uh, this time, it's from the air industry. So any one of you know uh, how many spare parts uh, a, an airplane has? 3,000, but guessing? Well, it, it is even more. It's it sometimes go to tens of thousands of uh, of different spare parts, uh, which each uh, each uh, airplane uh, might might carry. It's uh, and uh, we have a serious problem with spare parts and uh, and maintenance of of airplane. So th the problem is simple. If if you look at it from a uh, uh, from just a theoretical uh, stand, okay, it seems to be easy. So airplane parts traceability should be something which the m uh, maintenance, repair, and operation companies and airlines need simply to know where each part comes from and what is the current uh, state of the part. In in I'm not sure if you know something about the air industry, the air industry are obsessed with one thing, which is, anyone? They are very obsessed with one word. It starts with an S. Safety. Safety, good. Why, why they are all obsessed with safety? because the airplane uh, will be flying. And what happened if something happened when it's a flying? It fell what down. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And no one wants to go in a plane which might fell down. So before I, and, and if you go to, to some documentaries and, uh, and other, uh, stories of um, uh, air flights which went wrong. Sometimes the reason is one screw driver, which has not been tightened uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in the right way, or it's not the right size. While this airplane is moving in a very, very, very um, uh, uh, high velocity, and uh, and. Uh, um, having all of this friction coming from air, anything which is not tightened can break. And once any part of the uh, plane break, everything else will break. Um, so every part having a proper um, uh, valid uh, life shelf and proper uh, installation is a, a, a matter of life and death. It's not something that we just take it easy or we can fix it later. It doesn't happen like that. So each airline, each maintenance, repairs, or operation company should know exactly what uh, 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 what each airplane has in terms of parts, where this part come from, and what is the current state. Is it still valid? So each part of this airplane will be given a number of flying hours or number of operating hours. So for example, an engine is good for 10,000 flying hour. Uh, after 10,000 flying hour, it should be replaced. If it is a 9,992 uh, uh, before the flights go, 
no one would like to go into a flight with uh, few a few hours left on the engine uh, lifetime. So all of this should be properly documented, properly updated, properly um, uh, recorded. And the problem with that is they do that. Okay. But um, uh, it, it is currently a nightmare because all of the type of challenges related to each part is something uh, it need a lot of effort and time to gather. Plus, there is no one agreed metrics uh, throughout all countries and jurisdictions. So in America, they have one metrics. In Europe, they have. Maybe in China, they have a third one. The international flight industry has its uh, its own standards. Uh, so, so you might uh, keep different type of records registered in totally different way. If you you are passing from a European to an American uh, uh, um, uh, airport, each one will be asking you on, on something different. Plus, there is. Uh, questions about the authenticity and the quality and the reliability of each part installation and uh, repair. So a technician who is lazy might put a check on one spare part which uh, he or she didn't uh, check well. Um, so um, uh, uh, in, in the airplane industry, it is a must before any plane go to, to any trip that each single part which are, we are talking about thousands of them, should be vetted and should be rechecked. This is why sometimes they delay uh, flights because they tell you, we found something in the plane we need to check on. And uh, uh, so um, uh, it is, uh, uh, and these parts are not a straightforward um, uh, history or um, quality, um, uh, 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 quality specifics that it is easy to check. Sometimes the same spare part have been sold many times and have been used by different airlines. And um, sometimes some airlines are good, have, have good maintenance teams who document things in a well uh, um, a documented manner. Uh, other airlines might not be as careful as such. So there's all type of problems about uh, reliability. Uh, so, and surprisingly, tra traditionally speaking, the traceability of aircraft part is paper-based process. So one guy who worked in, in the American Air Force told me that any for any single part in any jet, they will find a document, a thick document, paper document talking about the history of that part. So imagine how many how many uh, documents and folders uh, one airplane can um, um, can generate. And uh, imagine if some of it went missing or if they want to uh, go and trace back one part to an origin and that company said, no, this is not from our side. Somebody, uh, we sold it to that. Uh, air, uh, uh, airline, this airline sold it to another one, and we don't know what happened. So we, we cannot tell you anything about it. So there is a, a lot of effort and time and money is needed to ensure the quality of each of these aircraft part uh, uh, supply chain. Um, and to uh, um, uh, uh, without a uh, uh, ability to trace the history of each part of this uh, this airplane, um, 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 uh, they cannot do anything except test it again. And imagine how much it will cost them. So instead of me uh, trusting the record of of this uh, uh, airplane, I will need to recertificate and retest every single parts. Uh, and in many cases, these poor airlines will have simply to replace the part, not because it's not working, because they don't have the proper record. And, uh, and the data is spread in, on, from different parties uh, and isolated. So they cannot reach these data and they cannot make sure that uh, it is reliable. So if they prefer, okay, let me play it safe, let me buy this part again. And we are talking about parts that cost a lot of money. 
Um, so a lot of time is being wasted, a lot of money is being spent, and um, sometimes our safety in the air is being jeopardized. And what makes things even more complicated that there's a lot of people, a lot of parties involved in a life cycle of an airplane. There is the manufacturer, the, company, the country which manufactures these planes. There are the suppliers, the, the, the individual companies which supply the original manufacturer with the, with the parts. Uh, dismantler people who who take the old parts around uh, uh, away from the uh, from the airplanes and there are uh, customers uh, and repair companies installers uh, a lot of people who do stuff around an airplane and all of these parties although we expect that they all should come together and work uh, for one purpose to ensure that the airplane safety in fact this doesn't happen uh, uh, these parties are competing parties. They don't like to share data among themselves and they don't trust each other. So how we can push them to work on, uh, uh, to, to input data into a system which will allow them to trust each other. So this should add to the, to, to the challenge. The system which this airplane in, uh, air, airplane industry need is a system that all these parties can trust sharing data. There's, they know that if they share the data, they can control what data they share. They know that no one will come and hamper with their data. No one will come and change. Uh, if company uh, XYZ came and put data about their spare parts with another day company abc database they will be afraid that abc will be changing the data or hamper with it but if no one owns this record if all of them have equal access to them uh, then all of them will be more likely to put their data and uh, and have this layer of trust uh, so they can prevent any counterfeiting or fraud uh, and have the ability to trace and audit uh, this record so we, we went through two uh, case studies, two stories, story of why the supply chain of, um, uh, of uh, fresh food products is, uh, um, uh, um, uh, needs this traceability system, and also the same thing about the airplane um, parts. So now the question, so okay, what, we, we, we understand the problem, so what is the solution? The solution is easy. We need a trusted, secured, accessible record, which everyone can access, everyone can write and read without any party uh, ability to control and to change. Of course, uh, this uh, um, um, is a perfect use case for a blockchain. Why? Because blockchain uh, uh, nature as a decentralized immutable and consensus-based uh, technology make it perfect to overcome this challenge. And when we say decentralized, it means that there is no central party who control the blockchain. It is decentralized. There is multiple parties who are controlling it uh, um, and no one of them can change anything of it. So it is decentralized, not owned by one party. Immutable means that it cannot be changed. So once we write any type of record, any type of data on the blockchain, no one can come and change it because the nature of the blockchain is something that multiple parties are writing the same thing. So you cannot change if you want to change something, you need to go to multiple parties' uh, um, uh, data records and change it at the same time, which is near impossible. Uh, and a consensus-based mean that it you only can write or add anything on this blockchain once all the parties connected agree. So this is what means uh, consensus-based. So if part of the network said, we want to do this, we want to change this or do this transaction, and the rest of the network didn't validate it, 
the transaction will not happen. It need all the network, all the people or the parties or the machines who are connected to this uh, blockchain network to agree on, on this transaction to make it happen. And this nature of blockchain make it uh, make ability to produce transparent transparent and auditable uh, da uh, uh, data that keeps a permanent records of all transaction. And this is a very valuable character of a blockchain in which we can trust uh, uh, this technology to keep some of these type of records that uh, uh, we, we needed uh, as a proof for a transaction. So after a record is written to a blockchain, it cannot be altered. The digital thread will provide real-time uh, status of and the chain of custody and records of the st stored information. So real-time status because it's always recent. So you can always go to a blockchain uh, ledger and check, okay, what is the last status of this uh, data, whatever record it is. Is it a um, uh, ownership of a Bitcoin? Is it a, a record telling us uh, about a uh, condition of a certain food? Wh whatever is this type of a record. So uh, it's a real-time status. Uh, it tells you the chain of custody. So you can know that this Bitcoin was owned by Evie. Before that, it was by Eddie. And and, uh, uh, and now it's, it's owned by uh, Jessica. Uh, so uh, the chain of custody, you will know, okay, what is uh, the history of uh, of this record? And of course, you can have access to all of these records uh, and the stored information equally as any other party and on the ledger. So all of these characteristics of blockchain make it a, a, a great, uh, a, a great uh, technology to solve some of these problems uh, similar to uh, what I mentioned about the food and, and the, uh, the airplane industry. So uh, um, uh, a, a, a quick thing on how blockchain work, and I, I don't want to be very technical, but I'll, I'll try to explain it in a very simple way. So a blockchain is a number of many, many uh, devices connected to the same network, uh, and they use a, uh, the same uh, algorithm for uh, processing information. Anyone in the network can request any type of transaction, whatever transaction this ledger has been built to do. Um, um, so the request will go to, uh, uh, to all the participants in, in this network. If they are hundreds or thousands, all of them will be receiving uh, the same uh, request. Each one of these devices connected to the network will, will run an algorithm to validate that this transaction is right. So I'll give you an example. If I own one Bitcoin and I want to send it to AV and I press a button to request this transaction to happen, all of the people connected to, to Bitcoin a, a ledger need to, to verify that I really own this Bitcoin and I'm not creating it uh, through running my own code or such. Once all of them verify that, yes, I really own this Bitcoin, I got it from mining before or I got it from Eddie uh, previously. So they know and they validate that, yes, I own this Bitcoin. They will allow the transaction to happen to AV. And once it happened, all of them will testify and say um, uh, 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 Malik doesn't own this one Bitcoin anymore, and now it is owned by AV. If I want to trick AV later, and I want to, to uh, run a cheat code, which will get me back my Bitcoin, I will not be able to do that because all of these um, uh, other parties on the network have testified and verified that transaction happened. If anything other than that should happen, it should run through the proper uh, uh, um, uh, owner of this, of, uh, or the rightful owner of this Bitcoin and not me. So this is how validation happen when multiple parties testify that uh, 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 this transaction is, is legal. The verified transaction 
can be anything. It can be a, a creation of a new cryptocurrency like mining, or it can be um, uh, sending some um, like a crypto to another person, or simply it's a record saying that a basket of fresh lemon have been received and at the time of receive a temperature was reading such all of the um all of the um uh, parts were not corrupted and they were a uh, hundred box for example so whatever information i'm putting into this record is being registered and once it's done it will be recorded in a block of data and this block of data will be added to a chain of blocks which tell me everything about uh, uh, about the history of uh, 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 whatever i am uh, i am tracking is it a crypto or a, a, a goods in a supply chain or such and once it's added to the blockchain it will be permanent you cannot change it anymore so if i said i sent a box of lemon to Eddie's a warehouse, um, I cannot suddenly do another um, uh, a block saying, no, 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 this uh, uh, lemon has been sent to AV block uh, uh, warehouse or Jessica warehouse, not to Eddie. It will not happen because uh, already it has been registered that this ha that went to Eddie. If I want to take it back, I need to do a, a proper a uh, sequence of actors saying Eddie send it back to Evie or send it back to Jessica. I cannot reverse something already done on a blockchain. Once it's there, the, the transaction is complete and the records are there in, in a blockchain. This is why uh, the, the way blockchain work will make these records cannot be changed, immutable, and will give trust that no one party can change any part of the data without other parties in, in, involved. <coughs> uh, of course, uh, a blockchain, sometimes you go to some talk shows or read some articles about blockchain will be changing the world. Blockchain, blockchain will be changing, uh, will be replacing the, uh, uh, the old internet and everything will work on the blockchain. In fact, this is, this is a little bit uh, exaggeration. Blockchain can work for specific type of use cases, not everything. Uh, for example, uh, when uh, 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 it works well when you have these type of um, uh, of uh, situation, like multiple parties sharing data and multiple parties updating this data, and there is a requirement for verification. And um, uh, um, we need to minimize the intermediary, the middle people, uh, because they add more complexity. And these transactions should happen peer to peer because it's time sensitive. And these transactions interact with each other. So when we have this checklist all checked, or at least four of them out of these six, then blockchain makes sense. And in terms of money and financial transactions, it ticks most of the boxes. In terms of supply chain type of records, it ticks most of the boxes. So uh, um, not every type and not every problem can be solved by blockchain. Specific type of problems that fit certain criteria are, are good for blockchain. Okay. And blockchain work well with IOTs. And for you, I'm sure all of you have heard of IOT. IOT stands for Internet of Things. Uh, like, for example, smart home devices, security and safety devices, activity trackers, motion detectors, uh, sensors, uh, um, uh, all sorts of sensors, uh, humidity sensors, uh, heat sensors, um, etc. Smart automobiles, uh, smart cameras, uh, robots, uh, healthcare or fitness devices, augmented reality. All of these devices provide data and if they were connected to a blockchain ledger these data will be uh, 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 secured in, in a uh, uh, in a immutable record and can be used in a um, uh, in a trusted way um, uh, some some use cases for blockchain uh, in supply chain are 
uh, for example, um, um, to make sure that the vaccine distribution is it trusted, uh, securing these records related to vaccine, because you know vaccine is a sensitive, uh, have sensitivity related to uh, to uh, the, the date, the uh, validity date, and uh, uh, the temperature it need to be um, to be stored in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of these and uh, need to be verified and stored in a secure ledger. Another uh, another uh, use case for blockchain and supply chain is uh, all of these containers which uh, uh, which cross multiple countries, and we have millions of these. Uh, this these uh, containers crossing from one port to another and from one uh, uh, logistic and uh, hub to another so the whole supply chain of 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 tracking these containers and uh, 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 tracing them back to the origin is something also can be secured by blockchain also when you are a big manufacturing facility and you have multiple suppliers uh, giving you multiple type of uh, of uh, parts or raw material or such, uh, uh, documenting and recording all of these uh, uh, raw materials and spare parts coming from different uh, suppliers also can be secured by a blockchain and have ability to access the history and uh, audit uh, uh, whatever uh, type of um, goods you are receiving from from them. Um, another um, uh, uh, another similar uh, um, uh, use case is manufacturing, um, uh, keeping keeping track of all of these um, uh, parts and the the, the uh, supply chain related to them, uh, what we are manufacturing, each batch and where it's going, what warehouse it's getting, what uh, what packaging it's it's going, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Another uh, um, another use of blockchain and supply chain is what related to, to retail. Um, consumers nowadays would like to know the history of everything they are buying and make sure that whatever they are buying is uh, uh, whatever they are buying is uh, is authentic and whatever is on the label is really um, the, the right thing. Again, blockchain can secure that. So, so uh, these are some simple uh, uh, case studies which which uh, you can easily relate to. Um, um, and uh, as we are speaking, there is dozens of startups which are coming and innovating some very beautiful um, uh, concepts and technology and putting it into uh, uh, into action. Um, and if uh, 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 when I was preparing the presentation, I found a lot of these nice uh, startups, but I just picked a couple to give you an example on what's going on. So, for example, this company called Originistan, it 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 supply um, different supply chain parties with a timestamp. A timestamp can tell you when the time uh, uh, this document has been changed or record. So imagine all of these verification or records or ownership documents of all these goods which are moving through the supply chain can be time stamped on a blockchain to know exactly who who own it who changed it and when it happened and no one can change it anymore uh, another company called provenance which are uh, creating an app that can uh, give consumers a full journey of their uh, uh, product. So you know exactly where this product have came from and uh, where it had been originated, uh, how much time it took until it reached me, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so very, very nice uh, way to track whatever you are buying as a consumer. Uh, there is another uh, company called Chip Chain. It's producing a, um, a blockchain, especially for logistics, um, uh, and uh, which allow to which allow to, to track transportation of good and track the transportation of any good from the moment it has been shipped to the final uh, delivery. Um, um, and another one is called VeChain. VeChain is is a special a blockchain specifically has been. Uh, developed uh, having in mind uh, supply chain. So, so the uh, and this is another one called T food. 
uh, similar to the others, but it, this one is specialized to track uh, the origin and destinations of food, uh, a, uh, making it um, uh, uh, making it uh, um, uh, easy for um, uh, wholesalers or supermarkets to track the origin of uh, their food and all the um, middle stages in which they have. Uh, then uh, 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 a, 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 this company called Midi Ledger, uh, it's uh, it's specialized for tracking the supply chain of medical devices and pharmaceutical products, um, uh, also using the blockchain. So so this uh, and the last one is uh, Sky F Chain, which is a platform focused on supply chain um, uh, made by uh, flying drones and you they use a blockchain to record all instances that uh, happened throughout the journey of of this drone so we can track it and see make sure that uh, there is no interruption and to know where this drone went what type of uh, uh, things they picked up and where they delivered them um uh, sky f chain is going and last one is called uh, Zero One Capital, which is a, uh, a blockchain platform specifically made to finance supply chain related um, um, uh, projects. So, uh, so these these are in a brief um, uh, some of these uh, startups, which is bringing us some beautiful things in in uh, supply chain. Um, my timer say that it's still i have 20 seconds uh, to finish my 40 minutes which uh, which is good um uh, and uh, i would would like now to open it up for any type of question uh, either related to what i i presented or even something else around the blockchain uh, or or uh, use cases thank you so much malik that was so interesting um so I can start off. I do have a question. Um, so I remember recently reading about how Walmart is actually making it a requirement for all of all of its suppliers that have that are leafy greens to start tracking um, on the blockchain. Like it's not an option; it's a requirement. Yeah. And when I saw this, I thought, "Wow! Like this is kind of big because." this could set the tone for what the future will be like. So my question is, how long do you think it could take for this to become the industry standard? Do you think we're like five years away, 10 years away for uh, most companies to start requiring their suppliers to track their products on the blockchain? Well, well good, good question. If you asked me this uh, before COVID, I will tell you 10 years. But now, as as COVID came and people started to take things related to health and safety more seriously, I, I think it will take less. Uh, I think in the coming five years, we will see major retailers similar to Walmart going through the same thing. And uh, Walmart project has been done with IBM, uh, and IBM has a special type of a blockchain called Hyperledger. And uh, in in that presentation, I uh, at the end of my presentation, which will be made available. Um, I, I uh, added some online resources for expanded reading, and the first one was was the first three, in fact, uh, were all focused on uh, Walmart uh, story with IBM and what uh, what solution they brought us. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, I would. I also think that it, the word closer that it, that'll come uh, sooner rather than later, especially with COVID. Yeah. Hi, Professor. Hi. Hi, I okay. actually have a question. Yeah, I think it's Kami Brian, if, if that's Brian, easy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so just curiously, uh, you mentioned about the TE food uh, supply yes. chain. Uh, but, well, for, for manufacturers is, is another sort of sort of like a system that they kind of need to maintain 
uh, for, for this kind of services. So I'm just curious, like, how much it costs extra for food manufacturers to use this service compared to not using it? Like, because I think like if it's too expensive to maintain the service, you know, it will be hard for them to keep on using it for a very long term. Yeah, well, uh, Brian, this is a very smart question. Uh, the return of investment of this type of, uh, of technology. Uh, so, so, in fact, um, um, the question here is, is related to uh, not how much it will cost them to run it. Uh, the question is the other way around. How much it will cost them if something happened and they didn't have the right um, uh, um, uh, the right uh, uh, technology solution that enable them to track things. So uh, if if you are a supermarket, you don't want your reputation to be trashed if your people started getting sick because of a uh, a disease in the, in, in the food and um, uh, uh, um, uh, your your uh, uh, lack of ability to uh, know where it's coming from and stop it. So if you are selling your food products um, and you don't have ability to track where your food is coming from and somebody filed a complaint on you saying uh, there is a bacteria in, in your food, the, the first thing you do, you need to throw all your food. Okay, you need to throw it and you need to uh, to get rid of it. So this is the first financial loss. Second, you need to stop selling food until you investigate. So if you don't have this system, it means weeks of investigations, weeks of not selling fresh food to your customers and weeks of financial losses. So, uh, uh, and we are not talking about uh, reputation, we are not talking about uh, legal responsibility. Uh, I, I don't know about the China, but in US, everybody sue everyone. So if you uh, if you are a Walmart and you you sold something which is corrupted, the customer can sue you. Uh, so in fact, the cost of of not having these systems uh, is is much uh, much higher, multifold maybe 100 times more than, than what it costs you. And today, these solutions are, are being uh, 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 scaled and uh, every new app coming, it will make it less and less costly um, um, uh, for any, any party to, to use it. So I'm not worried about the cost. I am, I'm sure that the ROI, the return of investment will be multiple fold than whatever they will be investing in it. Got it. Got it. I see. So it's like uh, the the circumstance of not using it will actually be really harmful. That you know people, are, you know, manufacturers would just want to use it just in case they fail their business. I yeah. See. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, similar. Just, uh, have some more very detailed questions. Just just something that pops in my mind. It's like because uh, you know this mentions QR codes here, but what if people kind of just swap the QR code or and also like. In the process, you know, because it's off chain, you know, there's a lot of things that cannot be monitored. So I don't know if there's a general solution to prevent this sort of like a, uh, you know, just make sure that QR codes are valid, or or it really comes down to each manufacturer yeah. how they maintain the QR codes quality. Yeah. So so this is uh, uh, you touched on something uh, very important, uh, which is this blockchain solution is only a mirror of what you provide it. So, uh, uh, so this is why I mentioned IoT devices because IoT devices will be able to capture the information without a human intervention. So if the IoT device is working and give you the, the, the temperature of the room when the food was stored, I, I'm not relying on, on Jessica or Eddie to tell me uh, about the temperature. The IoT device will be uh, producing the reading and writing it directly to the blockchain. There's no human um, human uh, interface there. But human mistakes can always happen. Like, for example, a wrong QR code being uh, uh, stick to a different uh, product. Uh, uh, it might happen. And uh, uh, un until we have a fully automated solution, there's always a chance for error.
I see, I see. Yeah, that really makes sense. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Call me Malik. I'm not a professor. I'm not from an academia. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just, yeah, just, I'm Malik, just used yeah. to like call people professor. Yeah, no problem. Teaching me. <laughs> All right. Uh, I also had a question. I was wondering if uh, the technology price was based on the market price and therefore it could be changed if there's a pump in the value of the coin or a dump. Well, a good question. So most of these technologies are not related to a fluctuation of a cryptocurrency. And here, uh, and, and thank you for, for asking this because you reminded me to, to touch into something that uh, when we talk about the blockchain technology, we are talking about the underlying technology that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, we can use for creating a crypto or we can use for uh, cre creating records. Um, uh, and uh, although, uh, of course, if I'm uh, uh, registering these transactions on, on Bitcoin or Ethereum, it will cost a lot of money because uh, Ethereum and Bitcoins are uh, are made to be store of value and not uh, as a blockchain and has not been made to uh, to be um, uh, to, to be uh, 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 an enterprise friendly blockchain. Um, and uh, uh, however, we we have multiple types of new blockchains which are made not to uh, uh, issue and uh, trade cryptocurrency, but to, to keep records. And this, this blockchain uh, costs are very, very minimal. Uh, basic basic cost, which no one will, will feel um, uh, th the, um, uh, the, the pain of, of spending on it. Um, uh, so of course, um, um, uh, if, if we, uh, uh, going back to your question, uh, if we are using uh, Ethereum, yes, it, the cost will be impacted by the fluctuation of the market, but no one use, uh, will use Ethereum uh, for that. This is why, for example, in the case of uh, Walmart, they used Hyperledger, which, uh, which doesn't uh, really uh, uh, cost the parties uh, any transaction fees. Uh, just adding to that question, so... Uh, I actually saw a solution from Polygon, which they announced uh, a sort of like a ZK roll-up solution, but it's private and it's for 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 enterprises. Uh, it is called uh, uh, Nightfall, I think Polygon Nightfall. Uh, yeah, it, they cooperated with Ernest and Young to to come out with a solution mainly for enterprises, and I feel like their solution is kind of. I think it's kind of based on uh, using like Matic token to pay the services, but it's internal yeah. for, for their cooperation use. So I feel like these kind of system yeah. could be applied to, you know, these kind of TE food or those exactly. supply chain. Exactly. So 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 uh, Polygon Nightfall is one out of many similar type of uh, a blockchain, which enterprise grade blockchain, uh, privately permission, uh, uh, which are made um, uh, having in mind to lower the cost of transactions. Um, yeah, and also like committing the the status to to the to the Ethereum main chain, right? I think like I, not the entire, but the sort of like a zk rolled up uh, hashes or the status to the to the main chain, so that you know it is sort of ledgered. I think. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's what I know, so it's cool. Yeah, so they use they use similar algorithm as Ethereum, but it is not on Ethereum public chain, because if you want to publish anything on Ethereum uh, public blockchain, the same blockchain which uh, is used for the Ethereum for uh, cryptocurrency, uh, the cost of transaction will be high, because all of these people are using it for gaining and uh, trading cryptocurrency, which make the cost of transaction high. Uh, for us, uh, for the sake of supply chain, we don't want to use the same uh, place as they. We go to another place, which is less crowded, and we will not be uh, 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 paying as much cost as that. Got it, got it. 
Thank you. Yeah. I have another question, if possible. Yeah, sure. I don't know if we still have time. Okay. We have time. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if decentralized system were really the solution, because, for example, uh, the data would be widely open and um, well, I'll take an example. Um, if I'm a big company that orders a thousand MacBook from Apple um, and the data go through a decentralized network, uh, people from all over the world could see where the MacBook are at at a certain time in the chain. And then maybe they could go on the ship and take the container or even a smaller cargo or something like that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I like your questions, guys. You, you guys are super smart, and each one of your question is is really uh, critically question. Uh, uh, decentralized. Uh, systems or um, uh, decentralized ledger uh, technology are of two kind. Uh, Tim, yeah, you, you're. Uh, am I reading your name right, Timothy? Tim. Yeah, that's right. Tim. Okay, so Tim, there's two kinds of decentralized ledgers. One which is a a public, and other is a private. Both of them are decentralized. One of them is public. Anyone who is on the network can see them because this network can be plugged by any person. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, other, other main cryptocurrencies which people mine and trade, all of these are public network. Anyone can get into the, the uh, network and connect to it, okay? And there is another kind of decentralized uh, 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 ledgers which are permissioned or private, like the one which uh, which we just mentioned, the po uh, uh, Polygon uh, Polygon uh, Nightfall. Uh, these are permissioned. Uh, also, uh, a Hyperledger, which uh, Walmart have used, these are permissioned. You cannot plug yourself into the network without the permission of the other guys. So it is a private club. Only people in this decentralized network can can see the transactions, and uh, uh, they need to be permitted. So, if you are a supply chain uh, company and you deal with a hundred uh, different party, customer clearance, uh, truck company, um, uh, shipment agent, uh, packaging party, uh, warehousing, etc., you can invite all of them to be a part of this decentralized network and all of them will have the same voting right okay but only they only these people can see the information inside the network people from the outside if they were not invited they don't they cannot uh, come so we have these two types both of them are decentralized permissioned or private and and a public uh, each one of them has a different uh, use case. For most of the supply chain use cases, I guess what we need is a is a private or permission uh, blockchain. Got it? Yeah. Okay. I think I got it. So yeah. it's a decentralized, but still a bit centralized, as you have that level of protection uh, 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 given by. People. Yeah. In in a way, you can say it is it is limited. So uh, okay. instead of uh, the, the the differentiating factor, term is um, is not numbers of people in it. So it might be a public one. Anyone can al uh, is allowed to plug in, but only five people can. Yeah. And it might be a permission in which a thousand person is there, but they can only only pl plug in to the network in a permission. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I can't I can't uh, see I can. enterprises. Oh, oh sorry. Oh I, I was just gonna add well, I can't I just see had enterprises. Like one question. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You should continue. Sorry, 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 sorry. It'll be quick. I was just going to say that I can't see enterprises using completely public um, blockchains, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's not, yeah. Uh, it's not uh, common. Yeah. 
Yeah, just a quick question. Like, I, I think it will be my last question I ask a lot. Uh, ask so, as many as uh, you would like this way. Yeah, because I know there's a system for airplane ticket booking system called, I, I forgot the name, Ayaka? but it's like, yeah, I think so. But, but it's like for, it's available for uh, business that the airplane, uh, you know, corporate corporates to join, but also it's available for individuals like us to join as well. Uh, to to kind of just i think i think that's why like the covid during the covid 19 the plane tickets from like china to us and us back to china was so expensive because like individual people were able to you know buy the tickets you know instead of using those softwares uh but i'm just thinking like for supply chain is there a sort of like a scenario or use case where uh you know maybe not only just corporates are using it but maybe we can also invite like individual people like us to also kind of just join this network and use it i'm just curious if there's a use case like okay that. so so uh it it might uh till now till now there's no need but for example if you are sending uh a package on dhl or fedex or uh, or uh, any one of these uh international couriers companies uh you will be able to track your shipments yeah you you can go and enter the number of your shipment and see where it is currently these systems are centralized systems owned and managed by the courier company uh, one day i don't know it, it might be on blockchain cool cool okay okay all right, that's it, that's it, thank you. Any more questions? Will, will it be possible to have the presentation at the end? Of course, I'll, I'll send it to uh, Avi and uh, Jessica and they will send it to you, uh, yeah. Thank you for that. All right. Well, um, if no one else has any questions, I think we can conclude this event. Um, Malik, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us and putting this awesome presentation together. And thank you, everyone, for joining and, and asking such good questions. Um, I really enjoyed listening to everyone and engaging. Thank you. Well, I, I enjoyed the uh, session as well. And please um, uh, feel free to uh, connect to me on LinkedIn and uh, uh, or email me if you need any, uh, uh, if you have any questions um, or if I can be of any help uh, for you. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a good night and have a good morning to the people in Beijing. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Thank you.